Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us back here on the Skeptic Track 2023 at Dragon Con. Uh, with us today is uh, Blake Smith. He has been one of the hosts of Monster Talk since 2009. It is a podcast which uses monsters to talk about science and skepticism, and he's going to give us a talk about the Georgia cryptids. Thanks so much for joining us, Blake. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks to Derek, especially. So, it, it is... I. Thank you for coming to this. I mean, there's so many things to do at DragonCon. You could be anywhere. You're here learning about Monsters of Georgia. I really appreciate it. And you're in the skeptics track, so you know I'm probably not going to tell you they're all real. But uh, I, <laughs> I uh, want to say thanks again to Derek for putting together this track and also because he really introduced me into the podcasting world, and he was kind of a super connector for Atlanta Skepticism. And uh, he's just been really, really helpful to me and finding other people who like to see the world the way I do. So let's get started. When we uh, discussed putting this panel together, I was trying to think of what to do exactly. But uh, I've got, I, I do research on monsters all the time. We've, we've got, uh, I don't know, 320, maybe even 340 episodes of Monster Talk. It's a lot. I've stopped counting, basically. But uh, the idea of just looking at the monsters here in my home state is, uh, it should have been something I've done before. And honestly, Weirdly, I hadn't, and so uh, this helped spur me into spending some time on monsters in my backyard. Now, I grew up in Bartow County, Georgia, which is here, so I set up this little joke, a water monster, an alien, a Bigfoot, and a werewolf, I'll walk into a Bartow County kid's imagination. So I, I just grew up fascinated with monsters. I've always loved them. Oh, thank you. Yep. And if, if is, can everybody hear me in the back? All right, groovy. All right. So... Uh, that's Bartow County. I grew up in Cartersville, Georgia, and, uh, you know, used to look for Bigfoot in every little clump of trees that I could find. Uh, you know, grew up reading all the monster books in the library, watching In Search Of, and uh, anything I could find with monsters. That's what I loved. Later in life, I learned more about uh, scientific skepticism and critical thinking, and started to try to apply those to the question of whether these creatures are real. And it, over, since 2009, I've been sharing that research with the Monster Talk podcast with my co-host Karen Stolzno and formerly Ben Radford, who's here, I believe, I'm not sure if he's on the next panel or not, but this is something that I love and I'm, again, thank you for coming to talk about them. Now, as you know, most states have monsters. Um, like, I couldn't find any states that don't have monsters. In, in, like, almost every state has a Bigfoot, including Hawaii, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's just... <laughs> monsters spread wherever their stories spread. They, they aren't constrained by uh, genetics, biology, you know, food supplies, that kind of stuff. They live in their imagination. So, <laughs> um, so the monsters I wanted to talk about today are... Uh, Alti is one we're going to talk about. It, it's not exactly a lake monster. There's not really a lake, and it's not really a river monster. So I'm going to call it an estuary monster because that's about what it is. And then uh, I was going to talk about a poltergeist because we, uh, I, in my memory, I had a famous poltergeist story I wanted to talk about. Only when I did the research, that turned out to be a little different, but we're still going to talk about it. Uh, a space alien. I think it's pretty cool. You've probably heard stories that there have been alien crashes and that the government's hiding the bodies. You've probably heard this many times. Well, I'm here to tell you, at least one case, the government has got the body and it's on display right here in Georgia. So we'll talk about that. And then, of course, Bigfoot, a ubiquitous monster. We have to talk about Bigfoot. And we have a werewolf. Uh, so that's kind of neat. And she's a, a lady werewolf. That's, uh, I thought that was appropriate art, but, you know, that's not what she looks like. <laughs> so Bigfoot. We'll start with Bigfoot. I, I think, again, it seems like every state has Bigfoots being reported, whatever they are. They all start in 1958. That's when we get the word Bigfoot coined. Um, there were, uh, that's the Jerry Crew logging site. There were footprints found, and a newspaper story talked about the giant feet called the creature Bigfoot, and that story went viral, and that's really where Bigfoot comes in. Now, later down the road, people will take Native American lore and other stuff and try to lump it into this Sasquatch idea that Sasquatch goes back forever, you know, the, the idea of hairy hominids, hairy monsters, hairy wild men, those are as old as human history. We've got, I mean, if you go back to the oldest stories in human history, the myths of uh, 
say, Gilgamesh, then his friend Enkidu is a giant hairy man. So is that Bigfoot? I don't think so. But it, the idea of the hairy man is a, is a sort of available trope. It's out there. So 1967, we get the Patterson-Gimlin film. These are the two, probably the two most popular Bigfoot movies, Harry and the Hendersons and the Patterson-Gimlin film. Uh, I think it's the full sort of spectrum of what Bigfoot can be. Uh, 1977, we get In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. Uh, I also do a podcast called In Research Of, where myself and Jeb Card, an archaeologist, are going back through every episode and kind of, they, the show famously said, you know, these are not all the ideas, just what the producers chose to share. And so we are sort of adding the other parts, which surprisingly isn't always about just saying they're wrong. There's some, it's really neat because I, in my memory, In Search Of was all UFOs, aliens and monsters and ghosts. And really, it's got a lot of pretty good basic science documentary in there as well, although I like the ones with the monsters. Uh, again, 1987, Harry and the Hendersons, probably the finest uh, creature work uh, related to this topic that I've ever seen. I mean, even there, there's some really nice newer movies. Yeah, as a side note, if you ever want to watch all the Bigfoot movies, you're in for a, a long haul because there's well over 200. It's probably getting closer to 300 now. That's a lot of Bigfoots. Big feats. Big feats. Whatever. <laughs> but but we're talking about Georgia monsters. So Georgia's really famous, and it actually happened right before Dragon Con in 2008, where someone shot and killed a Bigfoot and proved Bigfoot was real for all time. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. No, sorry. <laughs> but seriously, um, did I just skip a slide? Hold on a second. Nope. Got them out of order. That's why. So Bigfoot, uh, this was a hoax perpetrated by Rick Dyer and Matthew Whitten. What they did was they claimed they had killed a Bigfoot and they put it in a freezer. And so they, the freezer was actually full all the way up with ice. It's very reminiscent of a famous uh, sort of hoax carnival thing called the Minnesota Iceman. And it hit the news. I, this was, so I, again, I've been a public skeptic for a long time. I remember my neighbor used to get into arguments with me about skepticism and, you know, because I would say, well, I don't know, or that's not, that doesn't seem plausible, or, you know, that's not reasonable, or that's not, you know, in compliance with how things work, you know. Uh, and it, when this news story broke, he called me so excited. Bigfoot's real. I saw it on CNN. They've got the body. And I was like, oh, that, is, I mean, for just a second, I felt that rush of excitement because if Bigfoot's real, I'm super happy about it. I'm not sad. I'm not disappointed. I'm joyful because that would be such a rich body of scientific evidence to find something that's probably related to humans. That's, you know, it would, just, it would be really good. And I was, oh, I could just feel it. And then I said, wait a second. Did they say they really got a body of Bigfoot or did they say someone reported that he had gotten a body of Bigfoot, because those are actually not the same story. It's kind of like the current thing with the UAPs. There's a guy who says the government has a body. Did he see the body? No, but someone he trusts told him. And it turns out that being told something by someone with authority is actually not good enough. We really need a little more. And so in this case, it turned out this story fell apart really fast, kind of over the course of that Dragon Con that week. Uh, it was all sort of became clear that the people involved and... In, uh, the whole thing was a fiasco. So it was really a rubber gorilla suit stuffed with possum innards, which is why I call it an impossibility. So, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> but Bigfoot's still business. It's big business in Georgia. If you get a chance, uh, there is a museum up in Cherry Log, up 575. And it, it's really neat. It's, uh, uh, it's, I wouldn't call it scientific, but if you want to know what it's like to go to a Bigfoot museum, that is a fine one. It's really got some great exhibits. Uh, I do seriously recommend it. Tr tremendous gift shop. It's fun. They're in, people are still hunting Bigfoot. There's active Bigfoot hunting groups. You can find them on Facebook, um, probably meetup.com, and they still go out and listen for wood knocks and try to catch the monster. It's, it's quite interesting. There's some really interesting splits in the Bigfoot community. A lot of people see it as a way to get back in touch with nature, and I certainly think if you believe there's a monster out there, you should go look. That's a good idea. Uh, I, I don't think it. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with camping with friends and looking for monsters at all. So, <laughs> so, but there's many sightings that still happen. People experience Bigfoot. If you want to learn more about the bigger scope of what I think is going on with Bigfoot, I would say check out Monster Talk. 
Uh, there's lots of reasons to think it's probably not a real animal, but I think if you look at it, you can learn a lot more about how to examine evidence and what science really demands in order to prove a creature is real and, you know, a body, some DNA. There, th these are great ways to talk about how we capture evidence, how stories spread, what uh, what we fear, you know, it, it, what are the commonalities across cultures? Because, again, these every culture has monsters. So uh, that's what we do on Monster Talk again. So shameless plug, please check it out. Now, when I planned this, I was going to talk about a poltergeist. Um, there was, on season one of Unsolved Mysteries, a, a famous ghost story episode. Now, you may recall Unsolved Mysteries was mostly uh, a true crime show and missing persons type show. It was a great show. But they would do these episodes sometimes where it would be about a ghost or a creature. And, and uh, although I hear Robert Stack didn't like that, uh, they were very popular episodes. And I think, again, much like In Search Of, many people remember Unsolved Mysteries as being an, almost a paranormal show. And that's not exactly what it was. But uh, this particular case, when I got to looking at it as preparing this presentation, it turned out it was much more of a traditional ghost case. This is very close to Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, it's in Marietta. Uh, I don't have the exact address. I did look it up one time, but um, not important. The people don't live there anymore. The, they were a retired couple, and they came to live in the Marietta community and began to have strange experiences. But again, very typical ghostly experiences, seeing figures and that sort of thing. But it was investigated by a parapsychologist named William Roll. And uh, he was a German-born paranormal investigator, uh, but he ended up in Georgia working at West Georgia College. And so West Georgia actually still maintains a parapsychology department. They're one of the few universities in the country that still keep this kind of program open. And the, uh, William Rowlett actually worked with J.B. Ryan, and J.B. Ryan is sort of famous as one of the first people to really try to apply scientific rigor to parapsychology questions. And uh, Roll came up with this idea that, that poltergeists were actually psychokinetic energy gone uh, wild. So he, he was very much uh, tried to formalize the idea that a poltergeist comes from a troubled teen who has latent parapsychological powers of telekinesis, and they're not actively doing it, but they're sort of passively using their powers to make this stuff happen. So he didn't really think pol poltergeists were ghosts. They were because there's always a teen involved. And he famously was involved with a case called the Columbus Poltergeist, which involves a woman named Tina Resch, our young teenager there. You can see her. Uh, very peculiar case. Um, Tina was in Columbus, Ohio, not Georgia. And she was doing things. OK, I'm just going to tell you. All the evidence suggests she was faking it. She was throwing things, and most poltergeist cases come down to cases where they can actually demonstrate that there was trickery involved. In this case, like with the photo of the phone being thrown, she wouldn't let the photographer look at her. He had to close his eyes, and then she would say when the poltergeist was manifesting, she would make a noise, and he should snap the photo, which is not exactly the sort of renuous, strenuous, uh, rigorous uh, tools that you would use to figure out whether something's really going on or not. And then James Randi tried to investigate the case, and the family refused to let him because they didn't want a magician hanging around. But also, I think he would have caught on to the uh, fiasco of how this was being captured. Tina, unfortunately, later got involved in a case uh, where her child died, and she ended up being held culpable and is... I, she's eligible for parole. I don't think it's happened. It would have been right around now, so I don't know how the parole hearing went. But uh, she she was in prison for many years, and I believe is still in prison in Georgia, which brings it back to Georgia. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so if you want to talk about a case where uh, the government is hiding bodies of aliens, uh, we have just one of those kinds of things here. So... As you may recall, uh, in the 1940s, there was a UFO flying saucer craze. And that kicked off this idea that there were aliens floating around um, and visiting us. And that story has changed over time. Uh, it's become a lot more sinister if you listen to some of the stories. But it's really basically the same story. Aliens are visiting us. Then sometimes the government finds out about it and they are hiding it from everybody by stealing the bodies away or destroying the evidence and uh, using men in black to uh, sort of 
make the witnesses afraid to talk. But in this case, it was actually three young men, Edward Waters, Tom Wilson, and Arnold Payne. One of them said, he bet the others, that he could get into the newspaper within a week. So, maybe not, if you're a, you know, a very sensitive person, don't like to hear about cruelty to animals, this is not a great story, I will keep the details thin. But basically, his brilliant plan was to buy a rhesus monkey, euthanize it, shave it of all its hair, dye it a different color, and then create a crash scene so that he could get the law enforcement involved. Because once the law enforcement was involved, the newspapers would be involved. So he did this, and uh, just a little bit outside of Atlanta, he took a blowtorch and created a burn scene and left the body there and claimed that, that this was an alien situation. Uh, the police showed up, the newspapers got involved, and the story of the flying saucer monkey man happened. Now, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation got involved, and they actually, uh, it was quickly identified as a rhesus monkey with all its hair shaved off, but they took the monkey and they put it into a little museum at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which you can still go see today. And so technically, an alien corpse is being kept by the government in a facility. <laughs> it's not a secret facility, and it's not so much an alien as a shaved monkey, but you know, I, I think we've got just as much right to that story as Roswell, so. <laughs> so Alti, Alti Mahaha, uh, is maybe our most famous monster. And if you go look at monster books, especially those published after about 2010, you'll hear a story that these uh, monsters have been seen since the 1830s and that they have some really strange uh, qualities. If, you, if you're the kind of person that's a lumper versus a splitter, if you listen to the stories of Alti, it is a very odd creature indeed. It's got scales, but it moves like a mammal. Um, and it appears in lakes and rivers and occasionally comes out on the shore. It's been described as serpent-like, eel-like, manatee-like, dinosaur-like, alligator-like. Uh, so is it one weird creature, or are people seeing more than one thing? Um, I think that's a really good question. Over here, if you go to Darien, Georgia, um, which I'm not sure what else there is to do. As a monster lover, I only went for the monster, so I didn't really stick around after that. Uh, I went to the Darien Welcome Center, and there is this beautiful statue of Alti. And it was built uh, by a guy, and I'm forgetting his last name. His first name is Rick, um, but I, we actually just interviewed him. It'll be on our next episode of Monster Talk. So he created this statue based on the descriptions. Rick Spears, I think? Anyway. Rick uh, is the artist, and he also creates art for Fernbank Science Museum here in Atlanta. So uh, the Fernbank Science Center, which is about a mile and a half from the Fernbank Science Museum, which uh, also has some great models, but he, he crafts these, and so he does natural history art, and he also does this monster. Now, there is a pattern that happens in monster stories, and it's not universal, but it frequently happens like this. Someone sees a monster and they report it publicly. If they didn't report it, that story never goes anywhere. But they report it to the, the media, it goes out into the public, people start talking about it. And this creates what I like to think of as a, a, an atmosphere of narrative permissiveness. Someone's gone out there and did that first step of talking about a monster that they saw, and now other people who saw something weird start to lump it in. Oh, I saw a weird thing. Maybe it's the same thing, and they start sharing those stories. I think over time, those stories start to get shaved down into a common sort of uh, template. And, and that's when you sort of have uh, what to expect when you see an Alti, in this case, or what to expect when you go to Loch Ness. You, everybody knows what the monster is going to look like roughly, what kind of things they'll see. And it, it makes it really easy to lump anything that you experience that's odd into that monster category. So... The other thing that happens is people know, even, even the most credulous person knows, that monsters typically don't just appear out of nowhere. There has to have been a history. So some investigators will try to find previous cases so they can establish that, of course, this creature has always been here. In this case, Alti, there's stories going back to the 1830s about sea monsters, but those are very clearly out at the uh, area where the Savannah River dumps out into the ocean. They're, they're, they're classic sea monsters. Um, but what Alti gets described as is, is quite different. The, uh, the first reports in the 1980s 
described it as eel-like, but then quickly started to take on these more manatee and alligator-like qualities. So in February 1981 was the first major story. That one came out in the Atlanta Journal. And recently, the only other sort of photo that I've seen of, of Alti was this 2018 mystery photo. Um, it looked, it wasn't, you couldn't really tell the scale from the photo, but it was described as being kind of similar to uh, a plesiosaur. And but again, not knowing the scale, it's hard to say what it was exactly. But investigators found out it was actually a art hoax. It was from a serial hoaxer who she makes a lot, or he, I'm not really sure. It, they use a pseudonym. Um, but they have uh, made lots of these sort of uh, crank, prank, art projects, and that was one of them. But while I was doing my investigation, I should say here that uh, what spurred me to Alti first, though, was not this talk. I got a contact from uh, monster investigator Joe Nickel, and Joe has traveled all over the world looking for monsters and written lots of books. In fact, there's a new book coming out from Joe, hopefully in October, from my company. So uh, I'm excited about that. But Joe was asking me if I could do some of the footwork on investigating Alti. So I went down to Darien and I hit the libraries and I hit the newspaper archives and I got a really big uh, stack of material for Joe for his own article and sent it off to him. But while I was doing the investigation, I found an, a, a story that was in one of the weekend inserts. It's a little bit different from all the other Alti stories. It's, in a re it's a review of Higdon's Restaurant, which was a very popular uh, breakfasting location there in the area. And what the story actually says was that in addition to the menu items, the whole first page is all about the food and sort of the atmosphere. But in the second page, it talks about how that uh, Larry Gwynn and David Newton had come up with the idea of creating this monster in the Altamaha River. They called it Altamaha Ha. You see, it's got ha-ha built into the name. This is actually what we call a clue. So <laughs> it, they originally wanted to make it into a giant eel, which they called the big kahuna. And it says in the article that that is uh, a redneck word meaning big lie. It's not. It's a Hawaiian word. But uh, it's a surfer word. And they, they knew that. But, but basically, they tried to create the story that this was a giant eel. And they went off and told this to a newspaper a person who didn't care. They didn't want to run the story. Then they kept telling the story to everybody and eventually gets picked up by the AJC. And then it's a real story. It's a big story. It goes on to describe how they have a scheme for selling t-shirts. And, you know, they're having fun. I found other stuff about Larry Gwynn calling him a colorful local character, which he sounds like he is, you know. So it's not to say that the people who are seeing something in those waters are not seeing something. That's not it. It's just I believe that Mr. Gwynn and Mr. Newton created a culturally available template where people could categorize their strange experiences as alti. That's my take. Your take may be different. And, of course, if anybody finds a weird plesiosaur-like creature living in the estuaries off of uh, Savannah's waterways, uh, I will obviously change my tune and be quite happy about it because I would love that to be real. Oh, it's an ill-conceived notion. <sighs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, Georgia has a werewolf, or does it? Maybe. And it's a lady werewolf. All right, so, now it's not in America's, but I couldn't pass up an America's werewolf in Loudoun's. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> so this story is set in Talbot County, Georgia, which, again, that's a little weird. You may recall the Talbot family name being in Universal's werewolf man movies, uh, wolf man movies. Um, so I thought that was a bit strange, but this is a woman named Emily Isabella Burt, uh, who lived from 1841 to 1911. She is a real person. Some of the rest of the story will not be real. According to the story, she grew up on a farm and her father died and her mother sent her off to be schooled in Europe. So she goes to Europe for many years and comes back um, an attractive teen and uh, when she gets back, the local sheep population begins to be predated upon. And the hunters or the sheep herders are pretty sure what they're seeing is a wolf. Now, uh, 
I grew up in Georgia. If we have wolves, they have died out by now. I, I've never seen one. We do have coyotes now. That's kind of a relatively new thing. I think I saw my first coyote in Georgia in 1995. I know they had been creeping into the state, but that was the first time I saw one. Um, and now they're quite common, just like armadillos. So we have invasive species, but I don't think werewolves are one of them, or wolves. But um, and it was also interesting that they were sheep herders. Um, this feels very much like a European werewolf story that's been migrated uh, all the way here. So anyway, the hunters get frustrated, and according to the story, uh, they start melting down their silver and trying to make bullets, which, pet peeve, I've done a lot of research into when silver bullets entered uh, werewolf lore. It's not an ancient part of the story. Prior to the 1900s, so everything 1800s and back, well, Actually, there's a, a pretty finite period because you have to wait until guns are invented and then you have to have the silver bullets, but then they don't actually show up in the stories again until the 20th century. Um, but what silver bullets were used for universally in the past was for killing witches. So witches would famously change into hares or dogs or cats and they would be, uh, they would be evil hares or evil dogs, evil cats, and you'd have to kill them, but you'd try to shoot them and they wouldn't die. And then you go, oh, Oh, it's a witch. So you take the silver button off your Sunday shirt, you'd melt that down, and you'd turn it into a bullet. You'd shoot the witch as a cat, and then the witch would show up with a hurt hand, and then everybody would kill the witch. It's just, it was a really simple and understand process of getting rid of witches in your community. Um, but that became the werewolf story in the 20th century, and I'm still trying to track down. I, I used to think it was the Wolfman movie. Uh, of course, in the original Wolfman, they used a silver cane, uh, but it does, it is the universal movies that introduce the idea of, uh, the silver bullet, uh, to most of the public. But there, I've found since I did my last episode on that, there have been some 20th century short stories that treat the werewolf with, uh, as a curse and that they have a silver bullet. So I'm going to be continuing that research because I think it's an important question of where does he, where do these ideas come from? But anyway, but back to Isabella. So the hunters, they get their silver bullet, they go out to get her. Um, and they see the wolf, and they shoot it, and it tears the paw off in some versions. And in some versions, she's just got a wounded uh, paw. But the next day, uh, poor Emily Isabella Burt has a comp like a, 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 the same corresponding hand that would have been on the paw is now wounded. This is classic werewolf story. So, But instead of her getting murdered as a werewolf, um, her family sends her to a doctor in Paris who specializes in lycanthropy treatment. Which, uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> so she goes to treatment for a while, and she comes back. She lives her days in peace. She actually dies in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, some stories say that the ghost of the werewolf, like they said the werewolf was cast out of her, but that the ghost of the werewolf still haunts the area. Now, trying to run this to ground, it turned out, it seems like, and I've only been researching this for a few weeks, but this, everything suggests all of this is coming from a 1996 book called Georgia Ghosts by Nancy Roberts. Nancy Roberts is a Southern ghost writer. She has passed away, but she wrote and sold a lot of paranormal books. So um, for this to have originated with her was uh, gave it a big megaphone to, to reach the uh, world. And since her 1996 book, this story has been repeated and riffed on uh, in hundreds of versions across the web and in dozens and dozens of monster books. So I tried to kind of track down what parts of it were real because there's plenty of things that can be checked. Um, oh, by the way, don't actually try to go to the grave. It, there, you'll see stuff on like roadside America type things, that, you know, that you can go see the werewolf script. No, it's on private property. Uh, you have to have special permission and the general vibe is don't, but don't bother. And also, She's not a werewolf. Spoiler. Okay. <laughs> Whoops. Went too far. What it, what it turns out is, uh, also, you'll see this photo, this woman's photo. Uh, reverse image search is a great tool, but I've been unable to find out where this photo came from. It does appear to be vintage. I think it's a real photo. It is not Emily Isabella Burt, so I don't know who it is, but it's not her. And uh, she actually uh, died of natural causes, and again, she's... Uh, uh, she died in Marietta. There's an, uh, her obituary is a perfectly normal one. Uh, nobody also nobody mentions uh, in any of the newspapers of the time. There's no talk about a wolf in Georgia. There's no talk about um, 
a, I couldn't find any listings for uh, Paris lycanthropy doctors. Now, my French is not good, so they may exist, but I, I wasn't able to. It, this story appears to be made up. The only question I have is, did Nancy Roberts make it up herself, or was it a story that was told to her? So looking at the book, the, uh, the contents include lots of ghost stories. And one of the ones that is in there, sort of like I thought it might give me the gauge of what sort of researcher she was is the story of the haunted Kennesaw House in uh, Marietta, Georgia. And the, this Kennesaw House is, uh, I believe it was formerly a uh, sort of a, a, a train side inn. It's right by the tracks. And now it's been converted into a museum. And there's a, 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 on the top floor, there's a museum. You can go see lots of interesting exhibits about local history. Um, but there is a ghost story about that place that's been lurking around for a while, and she repeats it. And the story is that some people were either working at the Kennesaw House or they were uh, visiting the Kennesaw House, and they took the elevator down to the basement by mistake. They were supposed to go up, but they accidentally hit the basement button. But when the doors to the basement elevator open, instead of seeing a stock room full of supplies or anything like that, it was a devastating and horror-filled scene of a Civil War-era hospital, soldiers wounded, people getting their limbs cut off. It was just terrible, terrible, terrible. Terrible? It was a terrible scene. And I was really struck by that story. I really was like, wow, that is, I mean, that's really dramatic. I, I need to go check it out. So I went to the Kennesaw house to go do my own investigation. I was, you know, just surreptitiously poking around. And I, I got in the elevator, and um, there's no basement at all. And I, and I thought, well, you know, if there's no basement at all, that seems like one of those things you'd want to include in the story. Like, there's no, there isn't even a basement button, but that's where the elevator went, you know? So it, 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 it's just made up. It's, and it, but it's been repeated in all kinds of Georgia ghost books. And so Nancy's repeating stuff that I saw in other books. And I think, so I think she's gathering the lore, but I can't find anything about this werewolf case prior to the publication of her book. So I have reached out to uh, her daughter, who is a lawyer in, I believe, North Carolina now, and is running, she's got the literary possession of, the, of, of all the manuscripts and stuff. So I've asked her if she has any more information. Haven't heard back yet. I was kind of hoping she would reply before the convention, but she didn't. Um, but, but that's okay. It, I, I don't think there's anything to it. I mean, one could say werewolves aren't real just because science. But uh, I, I, it is interesting to know it, when the werewolf story is based on actual events versus when it's just made up. And in this case, it's slurring, who was a woman who was apparently an upstanding citizen of, of the county and, you know, just just got her name somehow associated with this this creature and with uh, killing. And, and it's just, it's, she's, it's a sad thing, I guess, for the Burt family to have this uh, werewolf thing hanging over the family. And it's just not, it's just nonsense. So we do have some real monsters in Georgia, although they've been, uh, I think, um, maybe overstated. Uh, any, do you guys, anybody ever run into feral hogs? Like, I mean, my, my grandpa had 360 acres when I was growing up. And so, uh, out in Taylorsville, we, we had a problem with them. They come in and they tear up your, your, uh, crops. They're, they're messy creatures. And, they're, and they, they, I find them fascinating because while werewolves aren't real, Feral hogs are pretty fascinating because they look like normal hogs when they start out. But after just spending a year or two in the wild, they grow tusks. All their, all their old, uh, undomesticated traits kick back in. It's like they just become these giant hogs, like boars, yet they uh, have the size of a, of a breed that was bred to be as much pork on the table as you could give. Now, in 2004, there's this famous case of Hogzilla. This kid, uh, Chris Griffin, uh, shot this hog, and this claim, they, they killed it, and then they buried it instead of, you know, taking it to a way station, but they claimed it was over 1,000 pounds. And this photo makes it look like it's simply enormous. This is accomplished uh, through a common technique that should be familiar to anybody who fishes. Uh, it's forced perspective. You, you hold the fish out like this, and then suddenly, you, you know, your one-pound brim turns into a five-pound bass it's pretty cool uh but so we hear the kid is actually not as close as the hog the hog's closer to the camera and so it makes it look much bigger net geo did a special on this and they dug up the hog and, and they they came to the conclusion that even though it decayed it probably weighed about 800 pounds which is a big hog you know i i 
it's it, it is an absolutely legitimately dangerous creature. They they they're wild. They used to be domesticated, but they're not friendly, and they are quite devastating to your property if you're trying to grow crops. So uh, I do think feral hogs are a, a real danger, and you know people shouldn't be letting their hogs loose. I know sometimes they just escape, but uh, it, it is a problem still. And then of course fish. When I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I used to go hang out with my dad. My dad was a carpenter, and uh, I really took like one summer working on a roof in Georgia in the summertime to realize I wanted to be in IT. So, <laughs> but uh, my dad uh, used to hang out with uh, an electrician in, named Tom Akins in our hometown, and Tom had a newspaper article on the wall of his shop that was talking about giant catfish uh, behind Alatuna Dam. And it was really interesting because uh, the story talked about how the, the catfish were big enough that they could pull a kid off the shore and into the water and eat them. And, and that there had been divers who had gone down near Alatuna Dam and that they saw a catfish so big that it scared them. And many of them had quit diving completely because of it, which, you know, it, this was a newspaper story. And I was 10 or 11. I was like, that is, that's scary, man. Altoona, that's amazing. Like, you know, uh, now... Altoona is part of the Tennessee Valley Authority. It wasn't built till 1950, I think it was when the dam opened. So that's not much time to develop a giant catfish population, but uh, that was the story. But then what really kind of triggered it and as maybe being not quite what it seemed was I ran into the same story in three other states. And it turns out that stories of giant catfish being down by the dam and scaring off divers is literally classic urban legend it's like you it's 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 the kind of story that everybody likes to tell about their local dam and i've heard people talk about how that any lake at all can have a monster in it because all it needs is the human imagination and i feel like the same thing's true if there's a dam it doesn't take much to get a giant catfish now catfish can get really big uh this photo is of a 111 pound catfish caught right here in georgia that's a that's a honky bit. Now, that catfish is closer to the camera than the man. So even with a 111-pound fish, they can't resist the horse perspective. Um, <laughs> that's all right. But, uh, yeah, the Wells catfish sometimes gets like 11 or 12 feet long and is uh, commonly uh, cited uh, as being one of those creatures that might be Nessie. It might be all kinds of things, but it is just an unusually large catfish. They also grow giant catfish in Thailand. And, uh, you know, it's a great source of food and it's a great source of fishing stories. Um, and I would say that if I, even a hundred pound catfish, I believe would feel like a monster if I caught one. I don't think I've ever pulled one in bigger than maybe 15 pounds. And uh, that was once in my whole life. That's a sad story. Anyway, I need to go fishing more. Uh, so that is the Georgia monsters that I was able to track down for this presentation. If you want to learn more about Georgia monsters or monsters in general or science and critical thinking or how to use monsters to talk about science and critical thinking, Monster Talk is a great place to start. It's monstertalk.org. We also have the podcast In Research Of, which again is revisiting all the old episodes of In Search Of. We're in season four right now. Uh, we just recorded, um, actually we're getting ready to do we did, um, I think we'd try to tour in his next. So that should be coming out pretty soon. And uh, Joe Nickel was actually on that show uh, doing the Shroud Tour in episode, which is pretty funny because, uh, again, Joe's probably went and written about 25 books on these kind of paranormal topics. And uh, I, to see him there in 1979 is, is, is quite a treat. So I, I uh, Joe doesn't like technology. So I, I wasn't able to send him a copy of the show, but I, uh, I took some screenshots and sent him a transcript to remind him of what he said. So we're going to talk about it because he has lots of stories about behind the scenes uh, working with Alan Landsberg and, and getting involved in the show. Now, I have talked really fast and I could talk a lot longer about monsters, but I wanted to give you guys some time for Q&A if you have any. Uh, so is, is, do we, are we set up to take questions? We are. We are set up to take questions. Groovy. Oh, okay. Well, I, I will field okay. questions about monster talk, podcast, anything to do with monsters, critical thinking, skepticism, science. I also really like IT and robots. And <laughs> So speaking of robots, we have, we have a, a functional microphone in the front here, or kind of in the middle here. Um, don't touch it, or, um, but uh, it will adjust to your height. We are happy to welcome questions. Absolutely. Yep, I see somebody at the mic. 
um, of all the monsters that you know of, the cryptids that you know of, outside of America. Okay. What's your favorite? Outside one? of America. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious about the other ones. Okay. Um, some of them. That's a really good question. Um, I'm fond of the Mapinguari, which is uh, a giant Brazilian uh, folklore creature that is. Some people think well. One guy thinks is actually a giant ground sloth, but um, is much, fits much more into folklore. It has its feet on back. Classic folklore things are your feet on your monsters are backwards, so when people try to track the monster down, the tracks are going the wrong direction. And that's true for the map in Gwari, and it's true in a lot of Yeti lore, which I think is really interesting. So I think that right this minute, that would be my answer, although I, I really like, uh, I like the Yowie. I like all kinds of sea monsters. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's varieties of hairy hominids in every country, but, uh, yeah, I, I think those, that'd be my answer right now. Uh, my question is, which cryptid would you be most terrified if it actually turned out to be real? Ooh, that's a good question. Because you seem so positive, like, well, oh, I'd love to find out. But. I would not really want to see a chupacabra. I don't, uh, anything... <laughs> Not, not the dog version, but the Chupacabra classic before they went to New Chupacabra. Because uh, it was kind of an alien hybrid looking thing and it uh, drank blood and it uh, killed your livestock. And uh, there's all kinds of stories where it's associated with aliens and it like hiding in trees. And uh, they're super creepy. And I really enjoyed listening to the stories on Art Bell back in the 90s. They, they, uh, just living alone in an old house. On an AM radio, barely picking it up and hearing stories about weird animal attacks. Classic. Loved it. I mean, it's super scary, though. Would not want it to be real. Right? So, <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Uh, hi. Uh, if you would settle a debate with my friend group, um, supposing Bigfoot is real, who do you think would win in a fight, Bigfoot or a grizzly bear? Ooh, that's a good question. They do have overlapping territory. Um, some people say they're the same creature. So that is, you know, if you look at the uh, the bear territory versus where Bigfoot are supposed to be, it's astonishingly close. Um, grizzlies are fantastic. Their their claws are like knives. Uh, in all the stories of Bigfoot, while Bigfoot's super strong, I've heard of Bigfoot's, uh, you know, wrenching the heads off deer and that sort of thing. Uh, it's not known for its uh, Wolverine-style claws. Um, I have to say, I, I think the grizzly's going to win. I think Thank the grizzly's going to eat you. that big That's foot. what I yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. A lot of fans of the grizzlies. Okay. Next that's question. why they, you know, that's what the tree knocking is really about. It's keeping those grizzlies away. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I'm just curious, like of all the cryptids that you know, which one do you think is like the most likely possible to actually exist? Well, if we took the Kraken to be a giant squid, uh, I think not only is it likely, but in my lifetime, it's become a real thing. So uh, it, that it was a long time that people knew that giant squid existed because they were falling out of the bodies of whales when they, you know, cleaned up the whales uh, for processing. But uh, it, getting them on camera was really hard. They were rolling up on beaches, uh, you know, dead. But seeing them alive in my lifetime has is, is been a spectacular thing. I mean, I know it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. But I just whenever researchers and investigators find proof of something, it, it's thrilling. So I would say uh, the Kraken. Thank you. Next. Whoa. Isn't that wild? Anyway. We're talking about Georgia cryptids. I take it you haven't heard of the Possum Man. I have not. Is, not, is he, uh, does he have like two states like regular possums where there's a thick state and then a flat with a tire mark in his adult form? <laughs> <laughs> not quite. It's a man, I believe it's a man-like possum, right? That a man-like possum. So a man-like uh, possum. Some an, say a possum-like man, but yeah, man-like yeah. possum. Four to six feet tall, roughly, that stalks the woods of Raven County. Okay, Clayton George, so up north, it doesn't interact with people, generally speaking. I do have some trail cam photos. Does it have a prehensile tail? See, I can't say I'd have okay. seen the tail personally. Okay, does it have a pouch? That I don't know either. Just Why do they call it a possum, man? <laughs> Looks like a possum. Looks like a possum. I don't know. Okay. I'm no, no scientist. But what I do know is that it does stalk the woods watching folks. I've had somewhat of an encounter, I believe, as well with the possum man. 
uh, taking the trash out one night at this summer camp up there. Uh, walking back, dark, crossing the creek, I could hear something in the creek, right? Now, normally, if it's even a bear or a deer, you can scare it off making some noise. They're yeah. skittish. So I'm knocking this trash can against the, the wood of this Which bridge. might summon a possum. It, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm knocking it. You know, knock, knock, knock. All right? I get off the bridge. I swing. And that's when I hit what I believe to be the possum man. So I threw the trash can and ran. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not messing with that. No, no. I'm not messing with that. I have not heard of this, but I will be looking into it. That's yeah. really cool. I'll, I can show you the photos later, but uh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, check I, it out. I, I would Raven County. Uh, Raven? Raven County. Yeah, cool. Clayton, Georgia. Did you know Georgia has the second most number of counties of any state? Like, really? we're not even close to being the second biggest state, but we've got the most counties. We're the largest eight se uh, states east of the Mississippi. There you go. Geographically. Well, there you go. And we, we, we sure like our counties. And apparently we have rodents of unusual size. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. No, <laughs> oh, okay. Rodents of unusual size or counties? We have to combine now? Okay, all right. Yep, next question. So as a registered Native American, what's your favorite Native American, like, cryptid? Well, I don't know if it's a cryptid. Like, when I think about how, see, I, okay, personal, pet peeve. All right, pet peeve <laughs> is that I feel like there's part of cryptozoology which has sort of, in a very colonial way, come in and said, oh, you have a Native American story about a th blank. It's really a blank. It's like, yeah. we're just going to keep saying, well, you think, you know, it's a Thunderbird, but it's really this. And you think it's uh, a Bigfoot or you think it's a Sasquatch. That, those are not the right Native terms, but, right. it, you know, but it's really this, you know. So I feel like there's that going on. But if I could just pick... Uh, a Native American thing that I, I wish was real, and it's not a cryptid. Um, I didn't know what word to use. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I think um, uh, well, I'm torn. I love the stories about coyote because I like trickster gods, and so you know people are quick to say, well, you know, all those stories about a giant hairy hominid that talks—that's really Bigfoot. But nobody <laughs> says, well, you know, all those stories about a talking coyote—that's really a something right you know they just ignore all the ones that are you know too supernatural or weird but uh, i love the stories about tricks and tricksters and you know whether it's coyote or anansi uh, from uh, africa just i i like i like tricksters so cool yeah thank you next oh oh my gosh i did not expect you to self adjust yeah. the magic mic <laughs> <laughs> hi um so i guess i was curious about like your origin story, like what made you interested in looking at cryptids? I was bitten by a radioactive skeptic. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, so my, my actual story is I grew up uh, in a very uh, fundamentalist religious family and believed absolutely that the Bible and everything in it was absolutely real. Uh, and I asked a lot of questions and my mom would say, go look in the encyclopedia. And, um, and I started just learning all kinds of things from reading the encyclopedia because we didn't have Wikipedia yet. Um, and I think I had wanted to have something supernatural happen. I really did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, living a long life, I had never seen anything despite going to graveyards. My dad tore down old houses. I went into houses most people would consider haunted and took them down to the ground, you know, by hand over many weeks so we could recycle the materials. But if, if you were going to be a, you know, the kind of, they, they always say if you have a haunting that if you do housework or renovations, it's one of the things that could trigger the ghost. I never had that happen. But then I went to the Middle East and I was in the Navy and I had an experience where, I'm going to do this real short for time, but basically I was in my apartment and it was nighttime. I was alone. And I'd gone to bed, and I felt something crawl into the bed and get on top of me. And I thought I was being attacked. And I couldn't get out. It took a while. I finally you know, managed to get out of the situation, threw the covers off, turned on the lights. I could see the big lump. You know, There's somebody in my room. I, I, I believe I'm in a fight for my life. I ripped the covers off, and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, and so this happened several times while I was in the Middle East, and then it followed me to the United States. And there were lots of other things going on that made me believe I was being uh, subjected to a haunting of a, some sort of ma ma malignant spirit or something that was following me around. Then 
after years of trying prayers and smudging ceremonies and all kinds of things, I was watching a TV show and a guy named Michael Shermer was on as a guest <laughs> and he started talking about something called sleep paralysis. And I'd never heard of sleep paralysis, but apparently when you are sleeping, your body becomes paralyzed. So you don't act out, act out your dreams like a dog does. And when the dog's running, it's not you know fully mm -hmm. paralyzed. But when you have sort of a, a synchronization problem that you wake up before your body has unparalyzed, you can't move. And it feels exactly like you're being held down and, and, and being like embraced by something. Which, if you look at folklore, we have incubus and succubus. These, uh, these experiences are often associated with what they call hypnagogic or hypnopompic uh, hallucinations. And up until fairly recently, I'd never had that. I just had the, the sensation I was being held down. But it turns out if you have irregular sleep, that's one of the things that can easily trigger it. And I was working on a 24 hours on, 48 hours off shift in the Navy. So 24 hours on, you know, we did get to take a break for sleep, but it messes your sleep cycle up bad, right? And so that seems to be one of the ways you can get rid of it is if you can get a regular sleep cycle. Anyway... Uh, learning about sleep paralysis and how that can create these effects and learning about how these hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations can be very compelling, it suddenly explained a bunch of stuff, like a lot of stuff. And since then, I've had situations where I've seen shadow people and, you know, the sensation, the absolute convincing sensation, there's something evil in the room. I mean, th those are really normal experiences for sleep paralysis. But if you don't ever have sleep paralysis, it sounds like a crazy person story, you know, it sounds, or it's a supernatural story. So when I learned about that, I realized, well, what else do I not know, right? And then it turned out that wrestling wasn't entirely real. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I learned, to, like, I learned to use these tools, and I'm not even really joking. I, I was very interested in wrestling. I actually trained for a little while as a pro wrestler. And learning about how the trickery is done and learning how, you know, some of what you think is real is real and some of what you think is real is false. Um, it, it really helped me sort of hone my skeptical thinking and my critical thinking. And I've always been a science nerd. So I ended up combining all that, the sort of desire to tell entertaining stories, one hopes, and then to spread science and critical thinking information. That's how, that's my origin story. Cool. So, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. I like that. <laughs> hey, I was going to ask you, since you uh, were talking about Georgia cryptids, um, I think you mentioned it earlier, but... How much research did you actually go into looking into the Georgia Thunderbird? Ooh, not much at all. Uh, although I was, it was actually right before. I guess it was two days ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking with uh, Rick, uh, the the guy who did the art. He reminded me of uh, is it uh, Mount Eagle? I think is a Rock or Eagle Rock, Eagle Rock, Eagle Rock, Eagle. Rock Eagle. Rock Eagle. Yeah, I, I, I have to show that. Camp there, so, but well, see, Rock I went there. You know, it's a four H camp, right? And so the, our school, uh, my kids went there uh, as, as a field trip. And somehow I went all those times and didn't realize that that giant eagle mm -hmm. made out of rocks is between 1,000 and 3,000 years old. I thought it was part wow. of the camp. I'm an idiot. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's cute. It was like, it was like there's a giant eagle. Anyway, uh, but yeah, there's actually two of those sort of paleo sites so, uh, with, with giant figurines in, right here in Georgia. So we, we do have cool archaeology. But to answer your question... Not very, but if, if uh, when I get done, I will write that down and look into it. That's really cool. I, I'm very interested in Thunderbirds and giant birds in general. It's yeah. so hard to tell the scale of something when it's flying in the air. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact that there are so many uh, native stories all over about that kind of a creature is really interesting to me. Yeah, because the story of how I got onto it was um, I actually had a coworker and stuff like that who um, had told me that he actually was, um, I think, driving um, north northbound towards Atlanta or whatnot, and he was just stopping in the middle of traffic and stuff like that, thinking it was Uber. But the weird thing to him was everyone was getting out their car, people trying to get their phones and zoom in and take pictures and stuff like that. And, you know, he got out just like, what is everyone looking at and doing? And he said, man, I, I lied to you not. I had like a 30-foot span and stuff like that. That would be really wing. big. <laughs> and I was like... Oh, man, I need to look into that thing, but yeah. yeah. No, you should, and it, it sounds really, I think for from a, from an eyewitness perspective, mm -hmm. when we look up into the sky and there's nothing yeah. to compare it to, that makes it so hard to tell scale. Yeah. But like uh, in the case of, um, say, Mothman, for example, mm. before John Keel's book, Mothman was universally thought to be a giant bird. I mean, it was just a bird. Really? It was always a bird. And when this oh. book came out, it sort of changed it. There was a newspaper story where they called it Mothman, and now people who depict it, 
have changed the way it looks. So over time, monsters tend to change form. Uh, uh, it's a it's a sort of an unnatural evolution, if you will. It's happening in the human mind, apparently. But mm. uh, you know, Mothman used to be just wings and legs, and now you see him depicted with two arms, two legs, and wings. Uh, which is that would be a hexapod. That's a that's not oh, yeah. that's a little weird. <laughs> so that, so it becomes less plausible when you have this feature. The point of me bringing up Mothman though was that the sandhill crane is one of the birds that people think might have been behind some of the stories. Sandhill crane. Okay. And I got to see one up close here in Georgia. They migrate through here. They look like you, you might think they're geese, but they make a very strange noise. Oh, but these okay. are huge birds. There was one, it, one of them got out of pack or out of the flock and landed in front of our Wendy's. And I was going through the drive through and there, I looked, it was like an ostrich. It was enormous. It was like four <laughs> feet tall and had bright red bands around the eyes. And I was like, I know that's a bird. I just don't recognize it. And so I had to look it up. Uh, but what it, was the bird? Did you say there was sandhill crane? A sandhill crane. Yeah. So they are, have to look they're, up. they're impressive. Yeah. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Nicely done. So. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. I'll wait. <laughs> That's so neat. Yeah. I love how he's got the picture of that dog on his apron. He does, yeah. Um, so my question is, what is your opinion on skinwalkers? Well, I have a lot of opinions on skinwalkers. So do you mean the... Uh, I think it's the Dene legend of the Skinwalker as a witch type figure. I think um, it's really interesting native folklore. If you mean what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch, that's a different thing altogether. Which I, my my answer in brevity would be that I believe that what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch is a well coordinated media campaign to increase the legitimacy of paranormal content across both the public domain and the government. That's what I think is going on. I think it is people paying money and a lot of it to get their stories repeated. It's though there were a massive groundswell of interest in the paranormal happenings at a ranch in Utah. When in reality, what's really going on is some people are cashing in and some people are trying to push their agenda. I realize that's a real dry answer, but that's what I think is going on. I think, I think the Bigelow Foundation in particular is working to push that storyline. And, and I think that there's nothing to it. What you have there is a bunch of people uh, sort of using apophenia, they're finding patterns in nothing. And, and it is uh, extraordinary. And I wish that they hadn't uh, co-opted the name Skinwalker, which is still an English version of the actual legend. But the first time I heard about Skinwalkers was a creepy story from a guy I knew in the Navy who told me about it way before any of this stuff happened with Skinwalker Ranch. And it was a classic story about a witch getting revenge on someone. And I loved it. And it was, it was, it was creepy, late night, standing watch kind of material. We like to scare each other in the Navy. So that was, uh, that was good. So anyway, but thank you. I hope that yeah. helped. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looks like we got one time for one more question. Yep. Um, <laughs> hi, I am actually a very big fan of monster talking in research of, and I wanted to ask you about a monster that I have not heard you guys talk about. Okay. It's a Pennsylvania cryptid called the squonk. Ooh. And it is so ugly that it is crying all of the time and no one loves it. And that is the concept of this cryptid. I <laughs> it have, is a pig-like. Yeah. Like a I, boar. We've never covered it, but I have heard of it before only because I read too much about monsters. Uh, but I, I don't remember much about the story, but I do remember the crying part and the pig-like part. It's it's basically that if you hear something crying in the woods, um, it is the squonk. Ah. And uh, like that, that is the sound. I, it's, I've heard foxes cry. Yes, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, it is yeah. most likely foxes. Yeah, that's, but, they do um, sound, I mean, hauntingly horrifying. creepy. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's like a baby crying mixed with like, the weirdest screeching you've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just the squonk is such a weird. I'll put that on the list. Maybe we'll bring it up. I don't know if we can do a whole episode. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like they're like little like cryptids that are the explanation for noises are fascinating. Well, we literally just had someone write me this morning uh, asking if we could do an episode about monster sounds, and I guess not just like the Bigfoot the Sierra yeah. sounds, but like the role of audio in the monster experience. So like literally when you, the way that sound affects your perceptions and how we misperceive sound. So I think mm -hmm. this, 
definitely some good stuff to talk about there. So yes. I awesome. thought the fox said ring ding ding. That's ding, right. Ding, yeah. Ding. <laughs> the skunk said. <laughs> okay, so we've got about ten seconds more for uh, oh. shameless plugs. Blake. So monstertalk.org. I'm so sorry. You can come up to me and ask your question after. Oh, oh, like, the Georgia counties thing. Um, back when Georgia was established, you had to be able to walk in to the polling place in one day. So that's why there's so oh, many counties. Oh, interesting. Because you had to walk. Did uh -huh. not know that. Good to know. That would do it. Yeah, it would. And Thanks. we're going to verify that, but so, still. Very, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That sounds plausible. <laughs> anyway, sound plausible. check out monsterdoc.org. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash in research of, and that's uh, my two shows that I'm talking about today. Thank you thank so much. Thank you so much for joining us on the Skeptic have a, Track. Have a great con. Yep. We'll see you later.